thank you, Musam, for inviting me for this uh, gathering, and thank you, Rasha. Rasha, thank you for inviting me. Amongst all these creative Palestinians and Jean-Vierve, when has Jean-Vierve? Jean-Vierve. Jean-Vierve. <laughs> it would take me centuries to, le to learn how to pronounce it. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, I'm so glad that we're sort of uh, gathering here. Uh, it's been a while since we Palestinian, I mean, creative people, are, uh, Palestinian creative people are really gathered together, as Mohanad said, and, and it's a pleasure. Uh, I mean, most of them are inspiration to me, Vera, Emily, uh, and the rest are uh, sort of keep on challenging my, my career and intellectual thinking over and over again. So I'm so glad to be part of this. And uh, I'm so, I, I hope that this would really continue as a ritual, not only uh, yani abroad, also in Palestine. We need to gather and start our conversation and to learn more about each other's work. Well, before, uh, before starting with the presentation, I would like to uh, put some assumption and frame the slides uh, that I'm going to view later on. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at history in this presentation and try to compare it with the present. Uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not really about being nostalgic to history as much as using history as a way of, as a lens to look at the present and uh, sort of use an uh, anachronistic way of looking, comparing time with each other and try to find out and reveal anomalies that is happening in our society nowadays. So history here becomes sort of a, a very important tool of reflecting on the present and really looking at those moments of history that has stopped and ceased from happening and uh, did not uh, partake in creating our present. So this is the history that I'm looking at, the history that stopped and didn't really continue to be, uh, to, to be part of the creation of nowadays. Uh, the second thing uh, is that uh, I'm so much, I've, I became so much obsessed with iconography and how, uh, the, uh, how uh, some of the most powerful Palestinian iconography are still lingering to the, pre uh, to the present, uh, although the present conditions uh, are so much in contradiction with the moment of their ori origin and their genesis. So I'm very much interested to see why these iconography has really continued to be working with the same powerful uh, uh, meaning and powerful uh, 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 connotation and uh, uh, thus uh, the context is totally different, and we're still using them as if the conditions of uh, the political and social conditions are still the same. Uh, the third point that I want to emphasize is that I'm not theorizing anything, it's work in progress, and uh, I'm just questioning things, and uh, it would be really a good opportunity from if uh, I really get also your feedback on, what, uh, on, on my findings. Uh, I want to start with Mohandan's film, uh, ended uh, two, days, uh, two days ago. There was a billboard of uh, this football guy, uh, and the football team is called Fidei. Fidei is a freedom fighter. And, uh, and I was very interested in, the, in this because, I mean, it's all about anachro anachronism, Mohanad. It's all about how the word Fidei uh, and the meaning of the word has been uh, sort of uh, meant to Palestinians in the 70s and 60s, 60s, 70s, till the 80s. And the way it has been sort of convoluted by uh, the uh, telecommunication companies, the media companies, and it has been reduced, uh, reduced to the, uh, a football team. A football team that Jawal, a very famous, the only telecommunication mobile company in Palestine, uh, has promoted. So you can see that the combatant now uh, is a football player without a machine gun. Uh, he doesn't wander, wander around the landscape uh, lurking for enemies, uh, for the Israeli soldiers, and he's not training to free Palestine. Uh, the combatant is a football player training to defeat other national teams. Uh, in a peaceful football uh, game, a quest that doesn't involve blood and killing. Uh, a quick gain of victory uh, and of def or defeat. Uh, 
the I'm very interested how the the meaning of uh, the meanings and the ideals of liberation has really shifted nowadays, uh, especially uh, in the 90s and after the 90s. Uh, liberation means, in, the, in this case, uh, that the football game, uh, in front, I mean, winning a football game in front of millions of people on TV. So the TV is a very important instrument to sort of being exposed and to win in front of all the nations. Uh, and it doesn't really, it's not really a personal quest and a personal belonging to an ideal, to a, a principle, to a collective uh, project. Uh, there is a deflation in the, in the, in the word fidaiyin from all its historical connotation and valuation. And this has become part of a systematic neoliberal paradigm induced by corporates via media and advertisement. And uh, so I wanted to start with this because I found it very interesting at a starting point uh, for my presentation, but my presentation would go somewhere else right now. But I thought that this is really an ideal situation for, uh, for the presentation. Uh, my interest in inverted vistas, actually, it's a landscape uh, that sort of I, I, I encounter the, on a daily basis uh, while traveling, I mean, driving in Ramallah and dri driving to my work. Uh, I used to work at Bizet University. So this is what I see on everyday basis. Uh, this is the diplomatic neighborhood. Uh, in Ramallah, it's a Palestinian housing project that is uh, only confined to diplomats and those who are really uh, in the diplomatic line. Uh, it's a gated community, it has a gate, and, uh, and, uh, and it's exclusive to those who are diplomats, uh, obviously, uh, and it sits on uh, overviewing a neighborhood in Ramallah called Atire, which is also uh, an upper middle class uh, neighborhood. And uh, it's always astounded me the fact that uh, it looks like a settlement. Uh, it looks like an Israeli settlement. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, but it's a set Palestinian settlement. Um, so from there, I was very much induced to. Uh, 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 to understand, uh, understand why do we sort of uh, replicate these images? Why do we sort of self-create uh, these images? And are we aware of that kind of creation? And does it really, what does it mean on a bigger uh, uh, context? What does it mean in, in terms of political and social production? What does it mean of the liberation project that we have? I mean, if the liberation project is producing these images, what kind of political produ uh, knowledge production uh, that we're doing? So these are the questions that sort of uh, stimulated uh, uh, the project of uh, sort of investigating these alternating, uh, th these inverted vistas. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this is just a small comparison. Down there is uh, a settlement of Ramon. Uh, it's uh, near Jerusalem. And up there is the same diplomatic housing project, by the way. Um, uh, uh, the question is not, it's not about uh, because of the Palestinian elites that resort to live in that Palestinian settlement. And it's not because of it's a gated community. Uh, it's just that I'm teaching at Bizet University a course in urban planning, and I'm always wondering why are we building these suburbs? I mean, the whole idea of suburbs have, has collapsed af after the, the uh, World World War, and uh, the only places that uh, suburbs are built actually is in the Middle East uh, from the Gulf money that after September 11 has been invested so uh, 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 in, in a fierce way in places like Lebanon, uh, places like uh, Iraq after the war, uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, and also Palestine and Jordan. Uh, so I was wondering what 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 is the common uh, common uh, relationship between uh, uh, this and the Palestinian Authority and its project of uh, Palestinian uh, state. So I remember reading this passage from David Harvey, the, uh, from the right of the city that I want to read. And each time I look at, uh, I look at this, that, this image, this particular image, uh, this passage comes to my mind. Uh, I quote David Harvey in the right of the city. Uh, but the suburb had been built, and the radical change in lifestyle 
uh, that has uh, uh, betokened and many social consequences. The soulless quality of suburban living also played a crucial role in the dramatic events of 1968 in the US. Uh, disconnected white middle-class students went into a phase of revolt, uh, sought alliances with marginalized groups, uh, claiming civil rights, and rallied against American imperialism to create a movement to build another kind of world, including a different kind of urban experience. Uh, uh, so, I mean, in th this contradiction between what I teach uh, and then what is really happening in the landscape is something that really drove my attention to that kind of uh, contradiction in the landscape that uh, 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 sort of caught my attention. Uh, on the right is my father's painting. My father is one of the committed Palestinian artists uh, from the uh, 70s and 80s. And uh, I remember uh, in my childhood, uh, there was so, mu so much uh, exposure to villages. I, I, I've been taken by my father and also a group of Palestinian artists, and they, they uh, kept on going uh, on and on to visit villages and draw these villages. And I, w I always wondered why villages, why the landscape? Uh, uh, then I really came to realize that this is the, the ideal, the uh, sort of the spirit of the 70s and 80s, represented by the commitment, uh, committed artist. It was important to render the farmers, the freedom fighters, the heritage architecture, the virgin landscape, no, no traces of colonialism. There's a purism in this uh, painting that really represents the essence of uh, the uh, liberation project in uh, the West Bank. It's the village, the core idea, ideal of the Palestinian society with its landscape, which is, uh, uh, with, with its purity and with its uh, hub of uh, cultural production and also agricultural production, which is very important. Uh, it's the roots and it's the resilience and it's the autonomy of Palestinians. Uh, uh, amongst, the, um, uh, amongst the depictions of the liberation values in Palestine, uh, Palestinian art of the 60s and till the 80s, the village took a central role in the work of many artists. In an interview with Dima Mansour, he asserted that the League of Palestinian Artists played a humane role, side by side to the militant language adopted by the Freedom Fighters Front. Uh, art was seen as the olive branch of peace, like freedom fighters were represented by the gun. And this is the, uh, the famous Arafat speech in the UN in 1974. Uh, whilst on the left side of the street, uh, the screen, uh, the fade colors used by the British artists rendering the uh, Rawabi, Rawabi is uh, in the new city, new Palestinian city, uh, which was built from scratch, and it's really promoted as a pioneering Palestinian project. And it, at a certain point, it was side by side on the negotiation tables with uh, 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 with the anchor issues like Jerusalem, like the right of return. So Rawabi has become sort of one of the anchors of the political uh, negotiation at a certain point. Uh, so Rawabi is depicted in a desert-like landscape, maybe similar to that of the Gulf. Uh, empty, sandy, and most of all, it looks like a desert uh, reclamation project. Uh, it also reminds us with the emptiness of the Orientalist paintings of Jerusalem. Uh, it's also an eradication of the cultural history of the place, an exclusion and deletion of the ancient villages around Jerusalem, and render it as an empty landscape. Mark Twain's visit to, Lab, uh, to Lebanon, Syria, and the Holy Land in 1867 was published in The Innocent Abroad, uh, where he described Palestine as follows, a desolate country whose, soils, whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly, uh, over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation, we never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. Such rendition of the landscape by text or by, by these drawings 
uh, was the base the basis of Zionism propaganda about Palestine, uh, namely a land without people for a people without land. So going back to the to the rendition of the British artist, uh, there's a sort of a, a sort of annihilation of all the villages. You know, uh, the rural Palestine is rich with villages. Between one village and the other is another village. And the distance between villages is really too tiny and you cannot miss a village while looking at the horizon, at the landscape. But in these renditions, such cultural landscape has been annihilated as if there's a reinvention uh, of such projects from zero, as if they're really happening on, a, on an empty landscape. Uh, these are stills from uh, uh, a film by Judy Price, Wyatt Oil. Um, Judy Price, she was doing her PhD and she'd done a film uh, on the stone, stone in, uh, mining industries in Palestine. Uh, so, and she really found interesting stuff that I want to sort of expose because it's related on the uh, transformation from the village that we saw uh, in the painting of Nabil Anani and to the village that we see now uh, in this still on the uh, left. Uh, the cynic Im uh, uh, imageries of White Oil unravel a tragedy of social and environmental hazards forcefully restrained on Palestinian villages and olive landscape by the quarrying economy. While, oil doc uh, uh, while White Oil documents the tragic reality of Israeli abuse of Palestinian stone quarries as a source for building their colonies on occupied Pal uh, Palestinian land. So the stone from the quarries, uh, Judy has really uh, uh, find, found out that it goes for building the settlement above uh, that you can see on the uh, uh, left image top. The film explore how sacred landscapes become unholy sites of conflicts and deconstruct uh, fictitious narratives on which identities of struggle and liberation are constructed, both Palestinian and Israeli. It's the same sacred landscape, the land of Palestine, which we persisted on sh uh, chanting in, the po in our poetry and music and rendering vigorously in our arts and fought for in our political struggles back in the 60s until the 80s in order to announce to the whole world that we existed uh, on this land long before. These sacred values have been shaken and we were pushed as, uh, and were pushed aside and have been divorced from the making of the Palestinian ident identity after the mid-90s as opposed to what's, uh, to what's rendered in Nabil Anani's Ras Karkar painting. Agriculture was the foundation of which Palestinians retired uh, to in time of crisis. It was their uh, s uh, sustenance during long strikes and defiance against successive colonial regime from British to Israeli. It was the foundation for independence and communal stronghold. The Israeli colonies in the West Bank and Gaza managed to rupture the village economy back in the 80s by means of daily waged uh, labor economy in Israel settlements. A new strata of labor emerged, uh, emerged breaking uh, the continuum of agricultural know-how to the, new, uh, to the new, uh, new generation. Riwak, Center for Architectural Conversa uh, Conservation, uh, uh, fights against time to save the rapidly vanishing historical buildings of Palestine. Uh, so the historic center are continuously demolished to make space for mosques or schools uh, or uh, apartment buildings. Nearly 30% of what has been surveyed back in uh, 1998 till 2000 by Riwak has vanished. Uh, less and less Palestinians are practicing uh, and living on agriculture as they cannot compete with the Israeli invasive agriculture project, uh, products in market. They're cheap and they look so plasticky and they're very appealing. Um, uh, not only closure, uprooting, expropriation of land, settlers' destruction of crops, export bans by Israel uh, is the only reason behind the deterioration of agriculture. The PA, since its establishment, uh, spends only 0.7% of its annual budgets on agriculture, while reserves almost 30% on security. 
This comes along mass rural migration to major urban centers seeking employment opportunities, whereby families in uh, rural areas are raising their kids to become urban in order to survive the tragedy of the rural Palestine. This is a funny image. Asliman <laughs> Mansour. Ah, do you have it? Ah, do you own it? Do you? Ah, wow. Wow. <laughs> so the film of Judy Price shows us how terraced olive landscape were cut like a cake by the stone quarries uh, and is one of the many artworks, uh, uh, it's, it's one of so many artworks that tackles this issue of transformation of uh, village values and the connotation uh, of the 60s and uh, the ideas of the 60s and 80s. So on the left, uh, the left side is the olive picker by Sliman Mansour uh, from 1984. Uh, uh, the olive is central to the subject of the painting, as you see, and it's uh, uh, also central to the uh, happenings of the communal, communal happenings around the olive tree. Uh, uh, it really sort of symbolized at that time roots and our roots to the uh, landscape and our right to the land uh, and also uh, it's part of the cultural identity of who we are as Palestinian and who we aspire to be. Uh, if you look at the background, the, the horizon, the extended landscape and you imagine that the same thing happening around this olive tree is happening on all, this, uh, all these olive trees uh, uh, up across the mountain, you can understand the whole uh, idealism of uh, uh, olive and its uh, uh, iconography in Palestinian uh, uh, cultural history. The hands of the man in Ode to the Tree, showing submission and uh, compassion. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, on the other uh, side, it's Salam Fayyad from 2010. And uh, it's the Palestinian Investment uh, uh, Conference in Beit Lahem in 2010, and where Salam Fayyad is standing and announcing for all the international investors and trying to get them, uh, get them invest in Palestine. The olive tree has become golden, and it's part of the uh, part of the uh, logo of the uh, Palestinian Investment Conference. So there's a transition in the value of the olive. Now the olive tree uh, is a, a, a symbol of economic peace. Uh, olive is for investment and investors, not for the community anymore. The village is abstract in the background with no details, uh, obscure, blurred, and indicative to old iconography. Hands of Salam Fayyad are up pleading for international donors and investors to invest in Palestine. As I was going back uh, to the wretched of the earth, uh, uh, Fanon's, uh, there was something that uh, sort of uh, uh, caught my attention, uh, especially in relationship to this uh, sort of uh, contradictory images and contradictory use of the olive uh, symbol. Uh, he said something about colonialism tries to disarm national demands by putting forward economic doctrines. As soon as the first demands are set out, colonialism pretends to consider them, recognizing with uh, ostentatious humility that the territory is suffering from serious underdevelopment, which necessit necessitates a great economic and social effort. Uh, this is very. Uh, uh, this has stopped me so much because it's always when uh, there's a withdrawal of uh, a physical withdrawal of a colonial regime from uh, uh, the landscape, from a land. There's always a sort of uh, uh, imposition of economic do doctrine, and I was really wondering why we have really adopted uh, uh, this economic neoliberal uh, uh, political. Uh, uh, direction towards building a new Palestinian state. And in the, an, an, an interview with Salam Fayyad in, in the Associated Press before his retirement, uh, he said, the Palestinian Authority now has reached the point of not being able to pay the salaries of about 1,500 uh, 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 
uh, sorry, 150,000 government employees. The number of Palestinian poor is bound to quickly double to 50% of the population of roughly 4 million. The Palestinian Authority already owes local banks more than 1.3 billion and can't get more loans. It also owes hundreds of millions of dollars to private businessmen, including suppliers of hospital, some of whom have stopped doing business with the government. Uh, so it seems that even the whole rhetoric of the uh, uh, economic peace is really also uh, going down the drain and it's really in crisis and without the donor money and without the aid of the uh, financial industry, uh, the whole economy would collapse because there's no, uh, not a, a sort of a substantial foundation for such an economy that really touches upon every single individual Palestinian. It's something that is really dependent so much on uh, loaning and on bank. Everything is really done through loans and banks and everybody is in debt. So this is the new, uh, this is the uh, sort of uh, uh, the threshold for a new Palestinian state. On the right is an image from Ahlam Shibli's death, a work uh, which partially investigate the visual cultural production in the streets and alleys of the refugee camps in Nablus uh, and the salons of the martyrs and the prisoners, uh, the families of the martyrs and prisoners. Uh, it's as if time has stopped in early 80s in camps. Murals about the right of return, posters of martyrs and prisoners holding machine guns and behind them the image of the Dome of the Rock. Uh, with slogans of liberating Palestine from Israeli occupation and the right of return is the only horizon for liberation. While just outside the boundaries of the refugee camp, if you look deeply in the image, uh, where you can see the green pastures, uh, a different temporal reality exists. Billboards, portals to the future, announcing a different type of a dream. Banks announcing loans for future homes or money for future wives uh, or corporates announcing exclusive dream neighborhoods uh, as if occupation ended long time ago and now we're trying to figure out our post-colonial conditions. It's a clash of dreams, a schizophrenia between a dream of liberation from Israeli colonialism and a post-colonial dream of state building project that simultaneously coexist uh, at the same time. It's a const there's a constant clash that is not really uh, 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 visible in the media between inside the camp and outside the camp. And it's always happening because of the clash of the, these two dreams and the, these two temporalities. Uh, I found, I found several uh, interesting uh, news ads uh, that I want to read for you. People from Asker refugee camp built a Palestinian security shack in Nablus in retaliation to an incursion led by the Palestinian preventive security to the camp, claimed to be pl uh, planning to capture a wanted activist in Fatah's hoax. Uh, an exchange of fire between the Palestinian security forces and armed men from the refugee camp led to the killing of the, a freshly released Palestinian prisoner. It was also reported that during the f funeral of the bari uh, and the bar burial cerem ceremonies, many police and security cars were torched and burnt in the city. Another news report. A car with dimmed black glass a pa a parked, a packed with young men from Kalandia refugee camp, drove in the streets of Ramallah with extremely loud Arabic pop music turned on, ordering the shops and stores to close due to a general strike, uh, to a general strike, and mourning on three men that were killed in Kalandia refugee camp by an Israeli military raid a day before. Uh, these two advertisements and lots more are happening on a daily basis. Not only the Israeli security army are trying to sort of uh, break the camps and try to break the resistance inside the camp, but only also Palestinian security forces are trying to clash with the uh, descent of uh, those living in camp who, as Sandy Hilal was telling us early in the morning, uh, there's an autonomy and there's a, it's a space outside 
politics and outside the economy. It's outside the politics of the PA, and it's outside the economy of Bashar al-Masri and Awabi. So uh, the camp are really a place of hope and a space for rethinking and reimagining a different relationship to uh, a Palestinian uh, liberation moment. Uh, I don't want to say a state, but a, a liberation moment. Uh, on the left is an early advertisement of Rawabi, the new city. I always tend to imagine how the graphic designer and the CEO of Rawabi worked on this image. So first, it looks like, uh, it looks like a science fiction movie, and we're on a galaxy so far away and the atmosphere is green. <laughs> so the graphic designer placed the modern city in the far horizon, but didn't look like Palestine at all. And then he decided to insert a mosque. But no, it doesn't look Palestinian yet. This can, can't, this can be Jordan, no? So bang, he inserted the olive tree, and now it looks Palestine. This dream, this Rawabi new city dream, is manufactured and has no relation with the context. It's constructed on a tabula rasa, and this is the new Palestine that I want to continue talking about. It's a tabula rasa of the history. It's the struggle history, and it's a dream that has been constructed from abroad and has been pasted on a tabula rasa with a continuous destruction of heritage, uh, uh, local hist uh, history, local uh, uh, intellectuals. Uh, so it has been sort of the language of the new Palestine has been reinvented without really being integrated within uh, what, what's happening. And now, Rawabi. Rawabi is a project of Masar uh, International. Um, Masar is a transnational corporation uh, that has many projects all over the Mediterranean and, uh, uh, and uh, some, some of the European countries. Uh, so uh, the project of Rawabi does not, does not, uh, didn't appear only in Palestine. As I said, the Gulf money, the surplus Gulf of money that was ceased to be invested in the United States and Europe in, uh, uh, after the 19, uh, 1911, 9-11, uh, uh, I'm changing history, 9-11. Uh, so uh, it was really invested all over the place, including uh, Palestine. So in, at that time, they decided to build, uh, in 2007, uh, a project uh, to host 40,000 uh, 40, uh, 40, people, uh, a population of 30, and they have invested 700 million uh, in 2012. All this, uh, I mean, there was, uh, at the beginning, it, the Rawabi project was really pub, uh, advertised as an affordable housing project, but suddenly the word affordable has disappeared from all the advertisement, so you don't find it anymore. Uh, Again, if we look at, on the left, it's the Rawabi city, and then the, the, the famous uh, uh, Modi'in uh, uh, settlement uh, on, on the right hand. And you can see how both of them mount the top of the mountain. Both of them uh, have uh, this panoptical uh, power of controlling the landscape around them. Both of them are designed for elitist, the settlement for the settlers and the Rawabi for those who would really fit with the image of the new Palestine and the new uh, culture. Uh, and both of them are constructed uh, to be exclusive uh, and to, uh, to maintain exclusive uh, life and to promote exclusive life for uh, uh, whether it's a biblical life or it's a new uh, Palestine. Uh, in its construction of a post-colonial aesthetic, the planning and architecture style of Rawabi becomes a reflection against the history of colonial attack on Palestinian ego and its rendition of backwardness and not, and, and not modern. And this is Fanonian. 
this reactionary aesthetic, aesthetical paradigm becomes part of the construction of the post-colonial aesthetics, not only to assert the perpetual yearning for the colonized, colonized to become as powerful as the uh, colonial, but also it pertains to the aspirations of the Palestinian liberation project since the 70s to, to become part of the universal the question of who I am, who am I, becomes inevitable, casting away any visual traces of cultural backwardness through disconnecting itself from the historical and geographical continuity. Uh, Rawabi, with a masculine ego, a pioneering Palestinian national project, embraces the aesthetics of, the, uh, of power embedded in post-war suburban culture uh, to compensate its long colonial suppression. Eventually, Rawabi becomes a moral example and a reference uh, to people with regards to their Palestinianity, the way and ways of conduct and lifestyle. It is a phenomena of a total disconnection from the Palestinian colonial present and the suppressive backward uh, history, uh, which is uh, required to be forgotten and replaced by uh, the temptations of neoliberal urban culture. Um, it's very interesting to look at all the advertisement of Rawabi, and you can see the common, the common uh, relationship. They're all introverted inside. There's no, uh, there's no uh, way to look outside. And if you look at the upper image on the left, you can see a blur relationship to the landscape. So the, uh, the, uh, the uh, graphic designer definitely blurred it over and over again to make it uh, weak and, uh, and not present. Uh, if we look at the type of people that are presented in these advertisements, we, we, I mean, these are businessmen. So it's really advertised for those who are part of the uh, new Palestine, those business, uh, 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 new generation that are going to go through business. And if we look down, it's all about a, a, a Dubai-like style, uh, public spaces for consumerism, and there's no I mean, none of the advertisement has really produced anything in relationship to resistance, production, a different alternative way of looking at culture, or, or uh, encouraging younger generation who think and think differently, and in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, innovation to come, creators, let's say, to come and live in that city. It's totally uh, uh, confined to business and those who really look at business as the only way of creating the new Palestine. Um, uh, and these are not really actually, uh, Palestine is not like that at all. I mean, uh, if you go to Palestine, this is a minority who's living there. Uh, they don't dress like that. Maybe in Ramallah, Beit Lahem, in major cities, but the rest are totally different. So the question is, Rawabi is to who? I mean, who, who, are, who is advertised to who? And who is going to live in Rawabi? And this is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is one of the images. This is one of the images that sort of go out outwards, go towards the landscape. And what we see is really uh, an image that is very problematic. It's an empty landscape. Around Rawabi, there are many villages. You cannot miss them when we, you go there. But then the graphic designer and people from Rawabi decided to select only a small segment of that image that does not show any of the villages. There's a sort of detachment from the past and a sort of, a sort, sort of uh, uh, an, an eagerness of starting anew, starting from scratch, as if nothing happened, as if Palestine is not there. Uh, we look at the young couples living there, also representing a small segment of Palestine, uh, looking at the landscape, enjoying the emptiness of Palestine, in enjoying the empty history of Palestine. And this reminds us so much uh, with the JNF project of uh, 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 forestation of Palestine and the destruction of JNF, a Jewish national fund. Uh, since 1901, and also the destruction of the uh, 418 villages in 1948. Uh, so the tabula rasa was the essence of building the state of Israel, and the forestation of the landscape was essential of changing the identity of the landscape 
uh, to match it with the biblical imagination of the land of Palestine, which was not as much as uh, uh, they anticipated when they first came to Palestine. They were shocked that this, not, this is not a biblical landscape that was really uh, mentioned in, uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, also, the, 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 it was very uh, eminent to, dis the, to, to destroy the traces of other cultures, the, the indigenous people, the Palestinians living there, and to uh, deflate them and uh, to sort of annihilate them and, forest the pl uh, and cover the massacres with forests of pine trees that also resembles uh, their, uh, their escape from the Nazis in the Black Forest of uh, Germany. And uh, uh, so, uh, and this I want to quote uh, uh, Simon Schama with his uh, uh, Landscape and Memory, which was a horrible book, by the way, I don't like it, but it's very essential to see how he really looked at the forestation of, uh, uh, pine forestation of uh, uh, Palestine. The trees were our proxy immigrants, the forests our implantation. And while we assumed that a pine wood was more beautiful than a hill uh, denuded by grazing folks of, uh, flocks of goats and sheep, we were never exactly sure what all these trees were for. What we did know was that a rooted forest was the opposite landscape to a place of drifting sand, of exposed rocks and red dirt uh, blown by the winds. Uh, the GNF has uh, experimented a, lo a lot on how to transform the language of the landscape into a more biblical Jewish landscape by means of experimenting of se so many seedlings uh, of pine trees that were brought from Europe, especially from Germany, and they've, they've done lots of experimentation and they've most of the experiments didn't work out until they found out a local tree, which is the Aleppo pine. Uh, and the Aleppo pine was indigenous and, and it really uh, fits with the imagery and, uh, of pine forests. Uh, they tried actually with eucalyptus trees that were brought by the British and they've really also forest, uh, uh, um, managed to uh, cover uh, huge areas of land with eucalyptus trees, especially near uh, 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 Tiber Lake Tiberias, uh, in order to drain the swamps and use it as a fertile ground for agriculture and their production, but but the image wasn't really that much as uh, as much as the biblical uh, imaginary of the state of uh, Palestine. Uh, sorry, the uh, uh, sorry Israel, uh, the biblical land, the land, the promised land is all about. The rationalization of forestation of the land, hence the erasure of the existing cultural history, was not only by means of claiming a biblical right to a vacant land uh, for uh, enrooting the Jewish diaspora. It was a determined systematic process of erasure of the existing cultural history and demolition of the 418 Palestinian villages. Uh, henceforth, reinventing a new geography, a new language of landscape by juxtaposing the imagined pine forest landscape uh, on the created tabula rasa of destroyed Palestinian landscape. Uh, so many of these uh, forestation has really uh, repelled many of the uh, uh, Bedouins who use these landscapes for their living. Uh, so they, uh, the, uh, the grazing pastures have been turned into forest land and the pine, as we know, uh, is poisonous and it, uh, it has, sorry, acidic uh, 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 things anyway. So it really turns the soil into unfertile soil for pastures and uh, uh, repels the uh, uh, shepherds and the uh, Bedouins away. Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, this also happened, uh, coincided with uh, a huge operation of expropriation of land uh, and uh, expansion of settlement. Uh, two last slides. Um, uh, this photo is in an Israeli settlement of Gilo, uh, overlooking the Palestinian town of uh, Bejala. Uh, near Bethlehem. A group of Russian artists were invited to beautify the walls of the settlement, close to a school, uh, so that young settlers would not be psychologically affected by the ugliness of the war. The murals they painted de depicts the hills and the landscape uh, opposite to the wall, 
as they would be without the Palestinian town of Bebe Jala. It's the same as the Orientalist paintings I saw uh, earlier. Uh, this mural clearly has a different purpose, not only to prohibit Palestinian attacks on the heavily armed settlement, but to mask the reality on the other side of the wall and render it empty, a land without the visual cultural evidence of its inhabitants, the promised land. Uh, the young settlers are raised on, on that tradition, on that rendered fiction of the mural, uh, the fiction that, uh, that sort of raised them to uh, relate to Palestinian and the uh, Palestinian landscape. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yes, he is. It's uh, Leila's uncle. Um, uh, to end up my uh, presentation, uh, my talk, uh, the problem, I think, the whole idea of the new Palestine came because we failed as uh, intellectuals, we failed as uh, uh, politicians, and we failed to imagine the day after that Sandy has always been talking about. We failed to uh, use fiction to imagine what does it mean to be liberated? What does it mean to, what does it, what does land means to us? What does economy, what does estate means to us? We never been discussing that, or our politics, or our cultural production was very reactive to that of the Israelis, rather than being imaginative towards uh, the future. Uh, I want to mention that this is not all, only the case in Palestine. There's so many brilliant individuals with initiatives, but they tend to be forgotten because we have only one narrative, the PLO narrative, and we don't look at alternative narratives that really bring a different imagination to who we are. Uh, Layla's uncle, uh, Musa Al-Alami, is one of the visionaries uh, who created this a different imagination of liberation uh, uh, in 1945, he decided to create a community, an ag agrarian community uh, uh, beside uh, Jericho. Uh, it's called the Arab Development Society, and he took money from the uh, 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 Arab Union, uh, and uh, he turned the desert into a green land. But that wasn't only the thing. He decided that this initiative should also include people and teach people uh, uh, along with the Khalil Sakakini's uh, teaching, that people living in that uh, sort of agrarian community, a socialist sort of a community, it was the fashion at that time, uh, they have to learn how to use their hands and uh, uh, to plant, to make their food and fix their surrounding and build it, their surrounding and also read poetry and think and uh, uh, do algebra, uh, algebra and also uh, train for gym and uh, uh, have a good uh, body and mind. So they, he, uh, and also uh, they have workshops there where kids were really doing wonderful inno innovative stuff. And they had shops in Iran, uh, uh, Beirut, and also in Egypt selling their products. Uh, that guy was really imagining a, a different alternative uh, imagination of liberation, which is outside cities and outside a consumerist society. A Palestinian individual is a productive intellectual uh, in relationship to land, and that was Musa al-Alami's vision. And he, in his manifesto in 1945, he decided that this initiative should really go uh, for 300 50 places in Palestine, and Palestine is all about these initiatives. So liberation comes from the uh, uh, from the uh, peripheries, not from the uh, main centers. And prefer uh, liberation comes from people, and not from uh, political parties. And each one is really part of liberation. So uh, such such histories are forgotten, and such histories did not really partake in the making of our present that we need as cultural uh, practitioners as creators to sort of investigate and probe. Thank you. period 
it's the yes the the role of the woman uh, in the imaginary and the relation between the woman as a, as a metaphor for the land in this period and comparing to this iconography of the new palestine of uh, the posterior you mentioned it's also a kind of a masculinization it's a kind of a, if you could speak if it, this makes sense this uh, is a shift also in this metaphorization of uh, the land as a woman and this recent iconography of this new ideology it's been more manly more masculinized um, i don't have so much to talk about that issue but i can improvise uh, i think that Land has always been a sort of yeah, a depiction of, women, uh, uh, of, of a woman and uh, the motherland, you know, uh, the fertile place where you can really grow agriculture and the death of the land means the death of the woman and the death of uh, fertility. And when the land is really, well, the death of agriculture is the death of the women. I remember reading a th uh, in uh, one of the books, I forgot the name of the book, but it's really talking about uh, 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 land and agriculture as the essential feminist com component in, in, uh, uh, in societies. And the more we lose uh, that part, the, more, uh, the fertility of the land and seeing things grow in front of us and being part of the process of growing things around us, we, lo we lose that component from our society. And uh, uh, our landscape, our visual culture becomes very masculine. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, there is a connotation of the, uh, the death of the land and the masculine, uh, uh, the masculine project. Actually, it is a masculine. And definitely, if women were taking, uh, take, I mean, uh, taking the uh, initiative of building the project of Palestine, it wouldn't be that uh, horrible, I guess. Thank you, Yazid. Uh, like, like in this morning's presentation um, of uh, Sandy, uh, you have allowed us to uh, at least discover that uh, where you are and where you work, which is university, is in good health. Alhamdulillah. If, if your students hear you speak the way you spoke uh, this evening here, then we are in Alf Khair. We are uh, not in too bad a situation because. Uh, when we hear the politicians, one wonders where we are going. But when we hear you as a professor of architecture and urban planning and art, and um, if, you, if you have transmitted to your students your capacity of looking at uh, where we're going physically in terms of uh, architecture and planning, uh, question that, the way you questioned it through your presentation, it's fantastic. I, uh, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go with the last Biennale of Rewak, not this, not, not this year, two years, be, two, two years before. I think also Christian, uh, Christine Wagner was with me. Uh, we went with all the artists, you know, because we remember we went to different uh, centers where we had, uh, Rewak had done uh, restoration. And we were absolutely flabbergasted. It was only starting to be built, but it looked like, like these um, terraces, which are beautiful, in fact, because they are all full of olive trees. They had become completely barren, mm. and they were preparing for the buildings. And half of the bus said, but you're sure this is a Palestinian project? It looks like a settlement. In fact, I'm, I am terrorized at the last picture, which is uh, Modi'in and, uh, and Rawabi, uh, and this one, yes, because it's almost finished. And it really looks totally like the settlement. In other words, it's the colonization that Sandy was talking about. We, our spirit has become colonized, really, because we reproduce what they are producing for themselves, which are uh, horrible ghettos that are an insult to the beauty of the landscape. And I, and I think that uh, if universities are the last place where people can think about their environment, where they're going, how they can be critical, at least uh, you give us a bit of hope. Thank you. Thank you. Yazid, <clears throat> if I may ask, how did you <clears throat> come to know about Musa, Alam, Musa Al Alami's project? Is it 
part of uh, a hidden collective memory or is it part of public knowledge? Is it something you were taught or that you had to really discover? Well, uh, it, it was part of a project that Vera and I are curated uh, that has been initiate, initiated by Vera Tamari. And it's called Cities Exhibition that really examines uh, cities each year and sort of uh, seek to explore and probe alternative uh, knowledge and na different narratives about them uh, rather than the uh, meta narrative of what we know from the PLO and the only knowledge that we know. And we're, we're trying to uh, see things that inspires us and really give us a different way of looking at our reality. Uh, so one of the cities that we investigated was Jericho, and I always used to go through the bridge, uh, cross through to Jordan, and look and see the uh, Arab Development Society. I never really understood what the hell was this place. It was at the edge, at the latest edge where you cross uh, uh, the Israeli uh, 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 checkpoint. And for me, it was really strange. But then one of the artists decided to go and explore it. And she went to the archive there and she found beautiful images, she, uh, beautiful books, and the manifesto of Musa al-Alami that I will uh, definitely send you, uh, Leila. Uh, 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 and his, uh, all his notes about how he envisioned that. And he was fought, actually, the PA at a certain point uh, was really in constant fight with Musa al-Alami because she, he, uh, uh, they thought that he's really settling all the refugees uh, because he decided to take in all the uh, uh, orphans, all the kids, orphan kids uh, inside and really work with them. Uh, so the Palestinian Authority was really fighting him badly and he was kept alone always and uh, he wasn't really funded but he managed to, uh, to create uh, the, uh, this wonderful initiative and wonderful utopia. Um, uh, uh, we, she took us there and we walked all the way to Jericho and we walked there and we walked around the place and she described, uh, we went to, uh, to the dorms and we saw the, the carvings of the students on the beds and I was shocked to see the ethics, they, I mean, and the books that they've been uh, uh, taught. Uh, it was ethic, poetry, uh, uh, literature, algebra, uh, history, science. It was really a sort of uh, an assortment of beautiful uh, subjects and, uh, and you can see them carving on the bed, where, where, where the bunker bed where, where they were sleeping poetry and nowadays I mean in, in the university uh, uh, other students would carve love messages and sex messages while those people were very polite and ethical and they were really poetry was the, the thing that they carved on their beds so I was really amazed by visiting this place and it has been sort of an attraction to many artists afterwards uh, and uh, uh, so now we're continuing to have a, a discussion with them and thinking about what to do with that place and how artists can go and learn from that initiative and what can we bring from that initiative to Palestine now. So that history that stopped, how can we really continue it to make a different present? Beautiful. Okay, so we take a short, thank you so much, Yazid, so much.